Let's pray real quick before we get into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together, for giving us this 45 minute little time in our morning where we can just rest, where we can have a break, we don't have to worry about class, we don't have to worry about what's going on in our life outside of this room right now. And I pray, Lord, that you will infiltrate this room and that you will touch the hearts of the people in here, that you will open their ears and allow for them to see the ways that you are moving in this room and in their life. And I pray this in your name, amen. Well, good morning. My name is Cameron, if we have not met yet, and I am a senior here, which usually when we have people speaking in chapel, it's not seniors at the actual school that they're talking to. So that's really cool. I am super honored and beyond excited to be talking on the stage that we have so many amazing chapel speakers talk at. And I don't know if I can live up to what they do, but I'm going to try my best here. So I'm going to ask you of something, though, before I actually start this message. I am 22 years old, I'm a senior, I'm graduating with a good chunk of the people in this room. So what I want you to do is I want you to not view me as a chapel speaker, okay? Chapel speakers, they come with all of this, like all of these different kinds of perspectives. And this perspective that each chapel speaker has, it's formulated on kind of their background, on the experiences they have, on the culture that they are. And a lot of that is what happens when they're released from college and they kind of go into the real world. But I am still in college. So instead of viewing me as another one of those chapel speakers, I want you to view me as being one of you. Because since I'm still here, since I'm still in college, I kind of have a very similar perspective as a lot of you, right? So that would be a great thing to do. And I know that what I'm going to talk about today is something that you need because it is very much something that I need. If you're in a position where you don't know what you're going to amount to, you don't know what the future holds after college, or you just, you have doubts about yourself, doubts about what you can do, what's going to happen with your life, then this is the message for you because I know that I struggle with stuff like that all the time. So today what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about narrative. And I, I'll be honest, I hated English in high school, but now that I'm in college and I've learned more about what this narrative, the idea of a narrative is, it fascinates me. Because narrative is like a sequence of events that happens in a story, and those events kind of determine how you see the world and honestly determines who you are as a person. So your narrative is incredibly important. And what we find and what I think we all already know is when we think about the ideal life that we have in the future, the plans that we make, those plans don't always turn out. And oftentimes, quite a bit, God will end up taking our plans and he'll just shift it in a totally different direction. And honestly, I can attest to this. I was not supposed to be here right now. That is my story. When I was in high school, I was an athlete for a little bit, and I stopped being an athlete because I wasn't good enough, and I started working with athletes, and I loved sports medicine. I loved this idea of kinesiology. I had this whole plan of my life where I was going to go be an orthopedic surgeon. I was going to do all that school because they made $400,000 a year, and that's awesome, right? And I loved working with athletes. I loved working out myself, so I'm like, that's like the perfect idea. And I grew up in a town called Bentonville, Arkansas. And you might know where that is. It is about 15 minutes from the University of Arkansas. So I was fully planning to be a Razorback. I had made all the plans. I had started the whole application process. And then, just to make a long story short here, right at the beginning of my senior year, God called me to come and to study ministry. And I didn't know what that was going to look like, but I ended up in the midst of the chaos deciding to drop all of that, and I came here. And now I'm a student at SNU, I'm a senior, I'm about to graduate. And it's just crazy to see how God came into that story and just totally changed everything, all of the plans that I had. So again, I say this shows us that we have these tendencies to plan out what we think is gonna happen with our life. But I wanna invite you today into a different way of thinking about this. So 
I want to introduce you to a man named Abraham. We're going to be talking from the book of Genesis today. And Abraham, I'm ho hoping a lot of you in here have at least heard of Abraham because he's a pretty foundational guy in scripture. He's known as the father of faith because he's very on in the narrative of the Bible and a whole lot of what happens afterwards kind of stems from the decisions that he made in Genesis. So Abraham was this guy, at this point in the story when we're introduced to him, he's 75 years old already, which by my standards, that's pretty old. I don't know too many 75 year olds, if I'm being honest, but He's 75, he's married to this girl named Sarah. Sarah is barren. She cannot have any kids. And Abraham is still living in his father's household. And that's not really a good combination. Because in that time, you're kind of defined by the lineage that you're able to leave, the legacy you're able to leave. And if you can't have kids, you can't really do that. So I'm gonna start from Genesis chapter 12, just four short verses, one through four. So. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. It says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So God calls Abraham to this big story with zero time for preparation, with no motivation to why he's going. God just says, I want you to go to this land. So Abraham has to leave behind everyone and everything and just go. And God promises to make Abraham into a great nation. And that's so significant because if you remember, he can't have children. So how is he gonna have Descendants as numerous as the stars. How is he going to become this great nation if he can't even have children? So this is a promise that God has given to Abraham that he has to then follow. And when I think about it, there's really three ways that we can live our life. The first way, we can live our life following our path and not inviting God in. The second way we can live is we can follow our own path and we can extend an invitation to God and say, God, I would like you to be a part of my life. And this can be great, because you can graduate college, get a job, get married and have children, retire, and eventually one day you'll die. And if you have God in your life, that's awesome. You can be successful, that's a comfortable life to live. But I think what so many people in our culture right now need to be reminded of is that when you invite God into your life, you can realize that God has a plan for you that's so much bigger than what you can imagine. And that leads to the third way that we can live our life, and that is to accept the invitation that God is trying to give us for us to be a part of his story. Not for us to live and include God, tag God along with us, but instead to accept the invitation that God has given to us so we can be a part of something much bigger than just ourselves. So I'm talking about God's narrative. What do I mean by God's narrative? What is that? When you think of scripture, I feel like a lot of people think of a history of a people and how this people, they have a God and his name is Yahweh. But what God's narrative actually is, is the Bible is a story of God. It's the story of Yahweh and his relationship with his creation. So God is the main character. It's God's story and the people are the way that he works in and through the world. And when you look at scripture, there's a lot of different people that we admire a lot who have joined into God's story instead of just living their own. We have Joseph. You remember Joseph in the coat of many colors from Genesis? He was one of the youngest of his brothers. He had a lot of brothers, and his father liked him more. So his brothers sold him into slavery, which, I mean, that doesn't happen very much anymore. I can't imagine, as much as I'd love to sell my brother into slavery sometimes, you know, I don't think that'd go over very well. But God found him where he was at, he became a part of God's narrative and he went on to be the governor of Egypt, right? And then we can also look, we have David. And David was forgotten when his father brought all of his brothers in front of this prophet. And his, this prophet went through all of his brothers and he's like, no, none of these are the one. Do you have anybody else? And he's like, well, I have my other son, David, but he's tending the sheep. He's tending the flocks. 
And this would become the next king of Israel. And David has written a, the majority of the Psalms that we have in the Bible today. So he became a part of God's bigger story. And then we also have a lowly peasant girl who grew up in a little town called Nazareth. And instead of living her own life, God called her and said, look, you're going to have a son. You're going to name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And she was the mother of Jesus Christ. So she became a part of this bigger narrative of God. So when we look at Abraham in this story, instead of leading his own life, he let God lead him. And therefore, he joined into God's narrative instead of just tagging God along to his life. What matters here is perspective. So what I'm talking about here, joining this narrative of God, this is no easy task, right? And I got a question. At what point did we decide that comfort is what should be leading us in our life? Comfort is what we should be directing ourselves towards and chasing after. Because that's how a lot of the world is today. We idolize comfort. We say, what is the best way that I can work less, not work as hard, and still be successful? Abraham, in this story, is the image of comfort. He owns a lot of land. His family has a lot of wealth. He's 75. He's just chilling. I mean, he's living at home still. And he is this image of comfort. But what we see in this story is that when God calls you to be a part of his narrative, this invitation from God is not safe. It's not comfortable. And we need to realize that God's plan for us, each person in this room, is so much bigger than that which we can comprehend. And this story, it takes courage. To join God in his story, it's dangerous. It's not safe. But it's so much better than we could do on our own. God can impact the world through us in ways we can't even comprehend, ways we can't even imagine. And it's not safe, it's not easy, it's dangerous, but it's what we are called to do. And when I read this Genesis on the screen, part of it says that all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So this isn't just okay, I'm going to become a part of God's narrative and my life is going to be better. No, when we become a part of God's narrative, that is God working through us to impact the world. And if it's just me, that's great. But there is like 300 people in this room. So imagine what that could be like if all of us joined into God's story and God works through us to impact the world. Because that is a force right there. That is a force for change. God used Abraham. Abraham, a man with Nothing going for him. A man with no future. I mean, his wife can't have kids, so he's not going to have any children. And the man needs to cut the umbilical cord because he's 75 and he's still living at home. Like, well, I mean, what's up with that? But God still uses him and sends him off. And that comes to show us that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. God can use you exactly where you are right now. It doesn't matter what point in your narrative you may find yourself right now. God is calling for you to become a part of his story where you're at. God loves you. He has a plan for you, and he has a future for you. When Abraham left, he was looking to this promise that God had made him, that he was going to be a great nation. He followed that promise from God. And just so, we are invited to do the same. And the only other piece of scripture I'm using this morning is Jeremiah 29:11. And this is probably a familiar verse. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and to hope. Your place in God's narrative, your place is to help further the kingdom because God has this plan for you. And what is so critical for us to realize, not only just at this point in our life, but at this point in the semester, as we are starting off this semester, is that the people in this room are the future. Not as individuals, but collectively, the people that are sitting here listening to me right now, you are the future, right? And it's hard for us to see that sometimes because we have all of these things like instant gratification where we are looking right now at where we are. What do I want right now? And it's hard for us to see that we can be the future, but it's important because what we do right now, what we do today will impact who we are down the road. And who we are down the road will determine the world that we live in. So it's so important for us to get this. And when I look around at the people in this room, we have a lot of different people sitting in here. 
When God calls us to be a part of his narrative, he's not calling for us to all be the same. In fact, the kingdom of God does not look like one homogenous group. The kingdom of God is so vast, and there's so many variety of people in it. And I know that we have people here that are going into business, going into psychology, people who design, do graphic design, education majors, music majors, and people who study all kinds of healthcare and science, which is just like, goes right over my head. You're way smarter than I am. But you have no idea what God can call you and use you with in these professions. He's given you these skills and he's calling you to join into his narrative and to use that to have an impact through the kingdom. So while we should look to the future, we shouldn't expect everything to turn out exactly how we plan for it to. We have to be courageous in this. And I'll be honest with you. I stand here today, I am a broken human being. I am terrified of what's coming up next. I graduate in like four months. What's next? I don't know. That's a good question. I should probably figure that out. But in the midst of my broken human nature, I had this one courageous moment in high school where I'm like, okay, God, if you don't want me to go to Arkansas, if you want me to come to SNU instead, I'll do that. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And I didn't come alone. I did know two people. Like Bo, Bo introduced me. If you all know Bo, that's great. If you don't, He's the bearded guy who likes to run around and tell fart jokes. That's a good way to know him. Somehow he still ended up with the girl, though. He married his beautiful wife this summer. He's a cool guy. But look at where God has led me. I made this bold choice to follow him here. And now I'm the student body president. I don't even know what that means still. If someone can tell me, that'd be great. But I'm student body president. I'm in the process right now of applying to six different law schools because God's call has not stopped just when I got here. It's still going. And I'm on stage right now speaking to 300 students at the school that I attend. If you had asked me in high school, is this where you feel like you're going to be in four years? I would have said, heck no. What? Why would I be doing that? I don't know how I got here, but I know that I'm in God's story. And this is exactly what God wants for every person in this room. So the whole point of this is that when we follow God's plan for us, we don't know what the destination is. We don't know what the end goal is, where we're headed. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham did not have explicit instructions on what to do. He just had a general direction. God was just like, go to the land I've shown you. And it doesn't then say after that, Abraham said, okay, I'll go. And he went upstairs and he sat on the couch and he started playing Xbox. Like, no, he didn't stall when God told him, this is what I want you to do. I imagine what he did was he went, he started stretching because, I mean, he's 75 years old. Dry scooped a shot of pre-workout and just like hit the road, right? He just got on it. The next verse says, so Abraham went and he was 75 years old. This is a bold and a daring act of faith. He is displaying faith in this moment. And Abraham knew that he did not need to know where he was going because Abraham knew who he was following. I'm going to say that again. Abraham did not need to know what the end destination was. He did not need to know exactly what he was going to be doing. He did not need to know where he was going because he knew who he was following. Because he knew he was following a God who promised him a future, who promised to be with him, to not leave him behind. When you're on a journey, which we all are, and you can't see the destination ahead of you, you have to focus on that which is directing you to that destination. To live into God's narrative is to travel in the direction of God by faith. And that's the key word, is by faith. We don't know what's going to happen. If we did know what the destination was, if we did know exactly what the journey was going to be like, we would be living based on fact, not based on faith. But we have to live into that faith and we have to trust in what God has for us down the road. That is how we become a part of his narrative. It's all about perspective. In this adventure that we are being called to, in this narrative we're being called to, God directs us. But he also redeems us along the way. It doesn't matter how smart you are. 
It doesn't matter how capable you are, how well equipped you are to go into the unknown. We are all going to end up falling back into our own path. We're going to get locked into our own story again. We're going to become selfish just because that's our human nature to do that, right? And I know that each and every one of you in here can relate to what I'm talking about. There are moments where you stop thinking about God, you stop thinking about others, you're just thinking about yourself. And the truth is, if we're being honest, you can travel in the direction of any number of things. You can travel in the direction of wealth, of power, of being known, of being respected. You can even travel in the path of becoming a good person. And you can have a successful life. You can have a comfortable life. I mean, look at me. I was chasing this $400,000 salary in high school. That's what I wanted to do. I thought that was going to be it. Like, that was the thing. But it's not until you travel in the direction of the Lord that you realize how small you've been thinking and how much more God has planned for you in this vast, big narrative that we can never actually fully understand. Just like we mess up, we see that Abraham messed up but he kept on going. I mean, the first place he went when God called him, one of the first places was Egypt. And he got scared, and he actually tried to give his wife up to protect him. Like, it's kind of hard to have a nation when you're trying to give away your wife, right? So Abraham messes up. But Israel, when they wrote Genesis, they did not leave that out of the story. They included that because failure is a part of this journey. A mistake made in effort of moving forward is better than going in circles. Or it's better than the regret of not moving in the first place. And God will take our failures and he will make them a beautiful part of our story. And that is the good news today. Jesus is here for us. He wants to know us. And he loves us so much more than we can grasp. He loves us so much that he came to this earth and he dwelled among us. And he died for us. And he died for us so that our sin does not define who we are. Our sin does not judge whether or not we can join in on God's narrative. And then he rose again three days later and he conquered death. So this is where we find ourselves today. We are in college, right? Some of us for longer than others. I mean... We have freshmen in here, we have seniors in here. So there's a limited amount of time for everybody. But I want to encourage you today to use this time, use the resources that we have, and figure out which of those three kinds of life are you living. Are you walking in your own path and not inviting God in? Are you walking your path and just extending a hand out to God? Or are you intentionally accepting that invitation into God's story? And it doesn't have to just be one. I bounce back and forth constantly. And that's just how it's going to be. That's the process of growing with Christ. But you have so many students around you right now that are here for you, that are going through the same journey that you are. You have so many professors and resources on campus that you can go to when you have questions. But I want to encourage you to not just intentionally be okay with staying in one spot. This is a journey of growth before we're released into whatever comes next, which again, we don't know, but we're not supposed to know. So I invite you to reflect on that today as we close. So I'm going to close us in prayer, and then we're going to get out of here. So if everyone would bow their heads with me. Heavenly Father, once again, I thank you for inviting us all here today to be together. Lord, I pray that you will move in the lives of the people in this room. That you will show yourself to them and invite them to follow you and where it is that you're going. I pray that we will cultivate our time here and realize how privileged we are to be at a university where people care for each other so much. We have a small community We have professors who want nothing more than our success. I pray that these students, including myself, will not take advantage of this, but we will use this time to grow in our relationship with others and to grow in our relationship with you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Yes. Thank you all for coming. You are dismissed.